So a little background from me. Uh, a few years ago, I was asked to provide an HRE, short for Historic Resource Evaluation, by the planner reviewing a project I was doing in West Berkeley. I have never been asked to do this before in the 28 years of my experience at that point, mostly doing remodels. I was a little surprised, but uh, the house we were planning to enlarge was a nondescript single family residence in a nondescript neighborhood. And I can show you a couple of slides on that. Uh, let's see, how do I do this? Uh, yeah, so there's, I guess my galleries in the way here. So, um, the right, the right, did everybody see that? Sorry, what did you say, John? Uh, so the right hand side is obviously um, the front, not a lot of interest there. There are nice trends and stuff, but, and the back is the, the other slide on the left. Um, so when I was, uh, let's see, so it had no historical significance, but I was persuaded to do a lot of research to prove that and wrote up a one-page report in the correct, and I'll show the, the um, format. Oops. Share. So, um, I don't know if you're seeing my whole screen or just this PDF, but uh, this is the State of California Resource Agency primary record um, form. So my planner was nice enough to show me what kind of form I needed to use. And uh, I filled this out, uh, said it doesn't appear to meet historic criteria included a picture and uh, filled out the uh, forms and I had no attachments really. Um, so uh, that was that. I turned that in. Um, the uh, planner was not satisfied and asked for an expanded description and more photos. She even asked if I knew about some mayor who had lived in the neighborhood at one time and my client and I came up with a few paragraphs to add the report. In that same report, we added a, a paragraph. Um, and we'll try to share that. Uh, let's see. Oops. Mm. Do you see that same report I just had? Yeah. Now the second page uh, was these three paragraphs that we added. Hey, Andis? Yeah. I believe we're seeing your notes. Oh. Okay, let's try this again. Share. Compatrier. That better? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the client and I put together these three paragraphs, added it to a second page for the, uh, although it still says page one of one, I don't remember why. Uh, but that was satisfactory. Finally, the, uh, the planner accepted it. Uh, so it was pretty, um, fortunately it wasn't, didn't require the kind of, um, report I ended up getting from uh, Rochelle and Allen, uh, which is much more complete. Uh, let's see. Uh, I have to say the process was painful and frustrating. I spent a lot of time I hadn't planned on researching, fretting, writing, 
weeding, editing, et cetera. So when I was told last year an HRE would be required on a new project, which you'll see later, I contacted Alan, who asked Rochelle to work on this with him, and I contacted my client to hire them to produce a report. Alan Dreyfus and Rochelle Byerly are our presenters today. Both work at Wis Janney Elstner Associates, or WJE for short. Alan is a California architect with 34 plus years of experience specializing in historic preservation, and his credentials exceed the Secretary of the Interior's standards for historic architecture. Michelle's areas of expertise are historic preservation, architectural investigation, and preparation of historic structure reports. She exceeds the requirements of the Secretary of the Interior for professional qualification in architectural history. So without further ado, let's welcome Alan and, and Rachel. Okay. Um, thanks, Andis. Uh, I also wanted to point out that um, I, I'm pleased to be back here at the Small Firm Forum. It was my home away from home for about 20, 20 years uh, when I had my own home. Uh, and it's still going strong. I think I, I think I was part of the group that was just called the Modelers Roundtable. Um, but anyway, it's good to see you all back again. Um, uh, I'm a little. I, I, we were asked basically to talk about you know the why and how you do an HRE. Uh, Alan, you're not coming through very clear. Okay, is this better? getting this damn thing as close as I can, and it's the only microphone I've got, so is that better? Okay. Um, so I have to say, I, I've been looking at this presentation with a little trepidation because, frankly, uh, we contacted the city of Berkeley to ask them why they were requiring this, you know, what was the basis for it, and we never got a response. Um, so really, we don't exactly know why, why the city's requiring this. Well, we do know why cities generally require them. We do know what they're about and what they pro provide for a city. And we have some, you know, by looking at the, the, uh, the application, the zoning application form and some portions of the, uh, uh, what, as part of the general plan, which is the preservation, uh, the preservation, uh, uh, and Betty can help me out here but uh, the, the preservation element of the general plan, we can sort of figure out what's going on. So I'm gonna to try to present that. Some of it's gonna be a little on the vague side. Um, so I'm gonna to switch to my presentation now. Everybody see that okay? Somebody say yes. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I don't see it. Don't see. No, don't see. It. Don't no see it. it's not there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. That's my fault. Hold on. I knew it would be my fault. How about now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So just in general about uh, historic resource evaluations, or as they're sometimes called historic resource analysis, um, we, we, this has been shortened here to HREs. Um, we are usually required, they're usually required by a local jurisdiction when a project involves a structure that they suspect is historic, um, but they're not exactly positive it is. You know, they've got some reason to believe it's historic. Uh, and they don't have anything else that tells them it's historic, like if it's a landmark or if it's on the California Register or National Register or even any kind of local, you know, citation like in, in Oakland, City of Oakland, it might be a, uh, you know, an A-rated building. Those all already tell the city that the building's historic and that it's a historic resource, whereas the only reason you would do an HRE uh, is to provide that evaluation for the city. Now, I noticed that Betty Marvin is uh, is in attendance, and I hope she breaks in whenever I say something that's not exactly accurate. Um, but that's my experience. And usually, what happens is I'll get a call from a developer um, saying that they've been asked to provide an HRE for the city, uh, either the city of Oakland. I've had city of Richmond, city of San Francisco. Never done one for uh, city of Berkeley until just 
recently. Um, we've done a number of them, uh, and and what I'm, you know, this the HRE generally what it requires is basic historic research um, to figure out the history of the building, who built it, um, what its use was, uh, what the historical context was around the building at the time it was built, you know, who the architect is. And that is used to develop two, two basic parts of the, uh, the HRE, which is a complete description of the building, including you know, all of the style and significant features that might make it important. And finally, in the end, a, uh, a, developed, uh, a, uh, a uh, statement of significance, um, be it architectural or cultural or whatever. Um, about a year ago, we started getting calls from uh, people in Berkeley who wanted us to do an HRE for a project that they were required to provide one for um, in the city of Berkeley. And I typically do if somebody, especially somebody I don't know, calls me on a project like that, is I Google Maps and I go take a look at the buildings. And I, the reason I was doing it is because often you'll get you know a, a from somebody I don't know, I might get a call asking for an HRE, and what they want me to do is write an HRE that says, it's not historic, you can demolish it. So if I pull up a building that looks significant to me, well, I'm probably gonna tell them that they're not gonna like my conclusion, and maybe they don't wanna hire me. So I pulled up some, some you know, visuals of these buildings, and I was very nondescript buildings, um, well, not literally or clearly no significance, but no the time we made some proposals uh, didn't uh, none of them came through I wasn't really all that broken hearted about it um, but in, in the end, you know. We were surprised that buildings of this were being asked for each other. Um, so we looked at, here's, the, here's the application form. Um, it basically says that a historic resource evaluation is always required for demolition of a non-residential building that's more than 40 years old. You have any building that's more than 40 years old that's subject to environmental review first pursuant to sequence. So what I guess is is saying is any non-residential building is, you know, provided an HRE is only in those situations of any other building, I guess it would be a non, you know, residential building because non-residential is taken care of in the paragraph above. It would only be subject to this if it is subject to environmental review pursuant to CEQA. Well, these buildings we were seeing did not jump out as something that would be pursuant to environmental review, you know, just not at the, at the level that we normally see. Um, so, just this is not the entire. Uh, uh, Excuse me, can I ask people to turn off their microphones? There's a lot of background. So, you know, this is either a couple of criteria coming out of the California Environment to discretionary project. And a discretionary project is any project that requires exercise of judgment or permission by a public agency. conform with all zoning regulations and they would issue a permit. It's sometimes called a by right permit, but in this case, it, you know, it's what we call a ministerial project, which is number two. CEQA does not apply to ministerial projects. So any hands and they review it to make sure that it meets all the zoning requirements and all the building codes, that is not a discretionary project. were ones that look like the kind of typical small residential project that would not be discretionary, um, that would 
basically if you met all the zoning setbacks and, and height requirements and met all the zone, the building codes, you would be given a permit. Um, so that, my was definitely scratching my head at this point. And I want to you know, note that the bottom note is that, is that um, any resource that is listed or determined eligible for the California register must be given consideration or sequel. There's what we were talking about before, where it says any um, building that's subject to environmental review pursuant to CEQA, that might be it. Um, now, it's, that's not complete because, uh, frankly, if, if a building uh, is considered a resource by a local jurisdiction, say it's, it's given uh, an A rating by the city of Oakland, uh, a landmark or possibly a, a structure of merit for the city of Berkeley, et cetera, um, those would also be considered uh, historic resources under CEQA. All right, so, so this, this slide came up and I grabbed it because it, it was interesting at the time. It turned out to be actually sort of a significant slide. I'm not sure where this was taken, but what occurred in the past, and I was familiar with this with the city of Oakland, uh, is good demolition permits only required a ministerial permit. So demolition of a building did not necessarily fall under CEQA. Now, if you had a project that involved the demolition of a historic building, that required review by CEQA. So there, you know, it was soon discovered there was a loophole here where you could tear down a building with no project, then you would have a vacant site, and then you, you could propose a project that didn't require the demolition of a historic building. So uh, it, Betty can jump in here if she if if I'm blowing this, but the city of Oakland changed the demolition permit so that it became a discretionary permit, which is uh, it you did you did not have by right have the have the uh, uh, ability to tear down a uh, a building of any type, and if the city of Oakland judges it to be historic, uh, they may not give you that permit, or they may only give you that permit if you go through some kind of environmental review. So Berkeley Municipal Code, I found this, there's actually this 23C08010 has about five different um, uh, citations or, or, or sections in it. This is one of them. Um, and what you find here is that no dwelling unit uh, may be eliminated except as authorized by this, this chapter. And B is the most important. The, the board may approve a use permit for demolition. So what they're saying is you need a use permit to demolish a building, uh, in this case a residential building, and the board may, which means that that's a discretionary uh, word, right? They may approve, but that means they may not as well. So now we're seeing that, that the permit for demolition of a residence is now a discretionary um, uh, permit and therefore would come under CEQA mandate. Now, I, I don't think that Berkeley did this to save historic buildings. I think they did it basically to preserve uh, residential units, but regardless of why they did it, it, it does exist. So I, I decided you know, after this to dive in into a little bit into the general plan because you know I, I don't you, know, you may be aware that the state requires that every city or county any large municipality has a general plan which is a statement of policies for development um, those general plans in cities like Berkeley and Oakland and San Francisco have what's called a, a preservation element or in this case urban design and preservation element and what the goal of the element is is to protect and enhance Berkeley's special built environment. Now, that is, you know, they state what that built environment is in, in, the, uh, in the element, but I'm not gonna go into that. They, they did go on to, to, to name about four or five techniques by which they thought you should do that. One of them was to protect existing resources. And obviously, Berkeley has, you know, uh, a large number of, of resources that have been recognized that are landmarks um, that are clearly, you know, uh, part of the historical and cultural character of the city of Berkeley. So that was one. Number two was, um, in, or this is actually number three in the, in the techniques that they cited, uh, under construction and alterations, 
they wanted to ensure that new construction and alterations were well designed and, and, had, and, and enhanced the character of Berkeley. Um, so that's basically where that got us to. But the question was, how do you protect resources if they haven't been identified? Well, this is uh, a Maybeck house up on, uh, you know, in the Maybeck Drive area. It's, uh, you know, it's, so we've got a, we've got a well-known local architect uh, who, you know, this is one of his, his you know, prime uh, uh, designs, no question about it. He's a city of Berkeley landmark, and it is listed on the California mm -hmm. Register as well as possibly the National Register. No question about it that that's a historic resource. Now, this is a random uh, uh, craftsman cottage that I pulled up out of a real estate ad. And it has nice character to it, but there's nothing that's obvious about it that says that this is a historic resource. Now, it, it, there's a number of reasons it could be. You know, it could be, you know, an anchor for a large neighborhood of these types of houses. It could be a contributor to a potential historic district or an actual historic district. I don't really know where this is, but you can see why, you know, if this has not been determined to be a historic resource, they might ask you to do that. This, this is one that popped up off the uh, Berkeley Architectural Heritage website. Um, you know, I was very grateful to this. Uh, it's, it is a little modernist building built in the 30s. And, and to the naked eye, nothing of particular you know, special quality, you know, nothing of great significance. Turns out um, it was owned by uh, a Japanese family and run from 1930 till 1995, which mean it, I mean it spanned the, you know, the period of, of Japanese incarceration. And uh, so it actually was a significant cultural um, element for the city of Berkeley and for the, for, for the Asian population. So um, it did get torn down in 2007, but you can see why you might have to do a little more in-depth research to be able to find out whether it was of some important significance. Well, okay, so heritage surveys. Um, uh, again, I'm gonna call on Betty if she wants to. Uh, the city of Oakland, uh, which I'm most familiar with, has a cultural heritage survey, which is actually quite, um, quite valuable. And it, it, as, as far as I know, they have basically visually surveyed, at least visually surveyed, every building in the city of Oakland. Um, and that may be as minimal as what's called a windshield survey, which in the old days involved driving past the building, taking out a little checklist, you know, that you filled out by hand, taking a photo of the building, noting any, any particularly interesting details and moving on. Um, there's a lot of other areas in the city of Oakland that are historic districts, they are individually um, listed buildings you know, and so forth. But when I'm asked to do a project in the city of Oakland, the first thing I do is I go to the Coastal Heritage Survey and I call Betty up and I say, Betty, what do you got? And she sends me either one page or 40 pages out of the file in that particular building. So very, very valuable. Um, city of Berkeley, as far as I know, and again, anybody who knows different, please step in. It's had a number of, of surveys. One, some of them, one of them, you know, the largest one I think was carried out by, has been carried out over the years by Berkeley Architectural Heritage Association. Um, they will you know, tend to concentrate, I think, on buildings that they find more important, some of them more obscure buildings that, that you, you might not notice important, but still you know, it is not a complete survey of all the buildings in Berkeley as far as I know. Um, so what we're left with, with the city of Berkeley is left with, is areas, neighborhoods, uh, houses that have not been checked you know, that have not been surveyed and they have no uh, historic material on them. So I'm seeing this and, you know, it's only my judgment from what little I know is that this, this HRE is, is a, it's a pretty heavy handed requirement um, on a homeowner um, in order to basically 
tell the city whether the building you're about to either demolish or alter significantly is historic or not. And I'm gonna go back down to this uh, zoning application. Now, this looks pretty cut and dry. There are elements within the zoning application description um, which Rochelle's going to go into that uh, that do mitigate this to some extent that say you don't ha have to do it if if some some certain things are present. Um, uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that to her presentation. Uh, and we're gonna I'm taking a break right now for anybody that has questions. Uh, I don't see anything coming up on chat, but I'm not sure I would, given the fact that I've got my screen on. I'm gonna shut this down. And come on, come on. How do I unshare from this position? Top of the screen, Alan. Top of the screen. This screen. Okay. Should uh, say stop share. Where am I looking that says stop share? It might be at the top, Alan. Very like top. if you have the mouse up to the top. And it'll... Yeah, move your cursor. I got it. I got it. Thanks. Move your cursor around. I think choices will become available. I see new share. I don't see. So oh, there he is. Sorry about that. All right. Well, thanks, Alan. Oh, uh, yeah, it was. Yeah. So, if anybody, I, I'm, should we take questions now, Rochelle? Just, just... Yeah, let's take questions now. Um, I'm looking through the chat right now, and there was a question from Donald, um, and it looks like uh, a Stephen Ross answered it. Um, I thought he answered it really well, but and also I think your presentation answered some of it. But Donald's question was: Is that is a request like? Um, or, requesting an HRE by a planner and arbitrary call, or is there some criteria? Um, Donald, was that, was your question answered? Well, okay. And Donald had another question. Um, what is the role um, or possible role of preserving information about a building and its significance, um, including perhaps virtual reality experiences in lieu of keeping the actual structure? Um, which may be even harder to retain. Well, you're getting into a question that is, you know, that is, okay, what happens if you have a historic building or a historic resource as identified you know, by your HRE for the city? What are they going to require? And we had a hint of that with, with uh, Andis' project because the, the building we were looking at, and Rochelle will talk more about it, you know, we, th we thought it, it could be a potential contributor to a potential historic district. Well, our planner, you know, red flagged that and said, geez, you know, okay, well, is, is the project, uh, does the project conform to the Secretary of Interior Standards? And he said, you know, we're not saying this is a historic resource, you know, because we got a potential and potential here. And finally, the environmental officer, uh, you know, jumped in and said, uh, yeah, a potential for a, a potential of potential is not going to, we're not going to call it a, a structure of merit and therefore it's not historic and therefore you're okay. But the first thing that they were asking us to do was not what I would expect if it is subject to CEQA, which is, okay, you guys got to do an initial study um, you know, effect on the environment. Um, what they said was, does it conform to the standards? Well, that's sort of a sideways way of getting at CEQA because CEQA does have a provision where it's, that says if a project conforms to the Secretary of, its, of Interior Standards, it's exempt from CEQA. So maybe that's what they're trying to do. I'm not sure. Um, as far as Donald's question about, you know, uh, what do you, if you want to demolish a building, will they accept uh, a simulation, you know, a re recordation? That's usually only done in when you've done a full EIR and the de demolition has been decided. It's been decided the de demolition is a uh, is un you know is a, a necessary. Uh, I won't use the exact language. It, you know, but but 
has clearly an impact on the historic resource, they will probably ask you to do a HABS documentation as a mitigation. But that, that's only at the end of a uh, of the full uh, environmental review. Doesn't it's not something that a city is going to allow you to do to demolish a building. It's not very likely the city is going to allow you to do that. Um, uh, let me uh, jump in there too because I worked on a project that was did have historic significance. Um, was it was a building a residential building? There were two residential buildings next to each other on the. Um, UC Berkeley campus, and they wanted to remove them uh, when they were building the, the uh, uh, big stadium, remodeling the stadium up there. And they got, uh, th they went through the whole process before we were in involved and were allowed to, to demolish the building. And a friend of mine said, uh, found out about it and realized they could buy the place, buy one of them for a dollar. Um, of course, they, they offered $17. They didn't want to look cheap, <laughs> but they did get the, that building. Yeah. Um, so there was, there was a whole record done of the building and all of the paperwork was all in place and they were ready to demolish it uh, before my, my friend took it. And there was probably maybe three weeks left before uh, it had to be demolished. And they demolished the other one. The other one was too big to move. Well, but, but, but it, what Annis is saying is important to note, they, they had to go through the full environmental review before they could then, you know, uh, uh, demolish the building. Um, and they had to acknowledge that it was uh, uh, an impact and, and, and somehow state in some form that it was absolutely necessary to do in order to do what needed to be done. It, it's, um, it's a long, long process, not anything you're ever gonna do for a small residential building in the city of Berkeley. Uh, it, it would cost more than the building costs. So uh, it's to be avoided, everybody avoids it at all costs. So um, I'm not sure what would happen, you know, uh, you might, you know, you know you, obviously they're asking that the, in, in the case of uh, uh, Anderson's project that uh, uh, we, we state that it met the Secretary of Interior standards, um, but we never got that far, so. So we have another question from Linda. Um, are these requirements? He's in here. He's in this one, huh? Portfolio no. prep. Oh, uh, someone's. Sorry, guys. Um, okay, so we have another question from Linda uh, Rudolph. Excuse me, Randolph. Um, are these requirements typical in the greater Bay Area or do they extend to the state level? Um, I guess I have a question back for you, Linda. Do you mean the HRE requirements or when an HRE is needed? Uh, yeah, when, it, when it's needed and is everybody as strict as, you know, <laughs> it looks like they are in Berkeley and Oakland. No, this is not a state requirement. I mean, okay, CEQA, just just local. CEQA, CEQA is state, but but you know, I could you know what, what that I, mean, I started off or partway through. I talked about uh, general plan. Well, general plan does two things. You know, it, it says to the state, to the local jurisdiction, you have to do a general plan. But it also, at the same time, it seeds uh, planning, you know, land use planning to the local jurisdiction. So it, it, it takes the state out of the land use planning business. Um, the state does come in when it, you know, for environmental review, or, or is, it is a state you know, law that has to be followed. But the, you know, this, this is the, the, all of, the, all of the, the things like enforcement of what is or what is not, you know, does, it, does or doesn't follow the Secretary Interior Standards, it's all subjective and it's all local. So, um, yeah, this is not a statewide requirement. Well, you know, but HREs are a pretty well established document and, and are used in many jurisdictions. So, thank you. And we have an, another answer from Stephen Ross um, saying that historic resources are protected statewide if there's a discretionary action. Um, that's, that's kind of what, of CEQA, yeah. yeah, that's part of CEQA, as Alan had mentioned earlier on in his talk. 
Um, sorry. Well, enforcement, enforcement comes from the local jurisdiction, um, I think. That's me, right? Whoever Steve is, I don't see him on here, but um, you may know more, more about it than I do. Um, okay. Sorry, I saw, I saw another question in here. They keep popping up. I, th I think Steve is actually a, a planner in the city of Berkeley. Correct, oh. me if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Steve. You got an expert, potentially. Yeah, so, so <laughs> maybe Steve, you could take a moment um, to see what I got wrong here. Yeah, this is Steve. You, you got most of it right, I think. Um, basically, I just wanted to clarify that CEQA, you know, requires that if there's a discretionary action, that it not have a significant effect on a historic resource. Right. And so that's where the city planner, independent, it could be anywhere in the state, uh, if there's a discretionary action such as a design review application, uh, zoning board review, those are all discretionary actions that the city has to make a determination on. So in this case that the Anna's first brought up, that was a kind of a, a, a run of the mill bungalow uh, that exists all over the East Bay. And the city wanted to know more about its uh, significance. Um, I, let me add that there was a use permit required. Um, That's the discretionary action. I think there were a couple of them. All right. Um, thanks, Steve. Yes, thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Okay, uh, we have another question. How can Minutes? I ask a question? I don't have that button. Oh, uh, it's there's a, if you move your mouse to the bottom of the screen, it may vary depending on your setup. Why don't we, Randolph, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, yeah. that's another way to do okay. it. <laughs> um, I wonder if a owner uh, lives in what is objectively speaking an historical house. Do you see it an an advantage in that owner getting it on the local Oakland or Berkeley um, uh, identified as an historic property by the either the city where it is? or uh, just simply leaving it till, um, you know, a project may come up to go through this process. If it's already an historical building, does that identify it as such and, and, and given a value, um, is that better for the owner in dealing with it in, in innovation projects? Yeah. I don't um, mean tearing it down. Yeah. I mean, um, I, no, I understand, um, Randolph. Um, yes, you know, changing if, windows or changing the building in some way. Or yeah, adding part, part of it depends on your attitude towards historic buildings, but if you have a historic building that you value, um, the question would be how much work would it take to get it uh, declared a structure of merit? It may take the same work. It may take some kind of an HRE um, to establish that, or you may be able to establish it more easily. So I think it really has to do with how much work is involved. Um, obviously, if you, I think if you establish it as uh, uh, a structure of merit, then you would not be required to do an HRE at the time of a project because it is basically established as a historic resource. Um, so I'm not sure it, it makes, whether it makes sense to do it early or do it when a project is, is undertaken. You know, my house was built in the 1870s, and it's the second oldest house in Rock Ridge. And uh, I know your house, Randolph, and I know it's historic. You and can't get away with anything. <laughs> but it's not on the. I don't think it's been listed. Should be. It would be nice if it were. Yeah, and then, and then if we ever sold it, I wouldn't want a new owner to rip out all the windows and put well, in. That's that's a good reason. Listen, so uh, Rochelle, are we? Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, real, real, I have one question real quick um, and then we'll I'll jump into my slides. Um, so this is from Dennis. Uh, what is the current thinking regarding the term historic fabric? He has a project in Berkeley where the um, planning boards um, say the building was not of historic significance, but 
um, removing something like the masonry wall um, in the building would cause damage to the historic fabric of the neighborhood. Hmm. It's a specific question and yeah. the term is historic fabric. And the reason is, is I understand historic resources, but in this case, what it was is that it was a, uh, the building, it was a URM upgrade. And the problem was is that that wall could not be saved and it would cause actually more damage to the building. And the history, and uh, since it looked like an old style, uh, 1920s uh, warehouse building that um, they it was the only one in the neighborhood they established that it was not of historic significance but uh, it, but that but it's that the removal of the wall and replacement would cause significant damage to the historic fabric of the neighborhood and um, it, at some point, you have to ask the question as to where the where it starts and where it stops as far as uh, the city's uh, discretion, and because uh, in this case it was a wall that couldn't be saved. Uh, um, but uh, it, but I understand the whole reasoning for it. But the but but the thing is, is that it's it's not something that is codified anywhere, as I can tell. Yeah, I've never heard of, of that before. I mean, typically, if the wall of this building, the management wall of this building, was considered to be important to the neighborhood, they would simply say that the building is contributing to the historic character of the neighborhood. They wouldn't they wouldn't pick one wall and and say, oh, only this wall. I mean. That almost says you could tear down the rest of the building and leave the wall. Um, I, I, I don't, I don't understand it. So, I, I, and I've never seen that uh, distinction made before. So, I, I the, the sense that I had at the time was that the city had about four million dollars in tax dollars for putting money into his buildings of historic significance, and what they didn't want to do is spend the money on this building, but they wanted to save, save, save it at the same time. And it was putting the onus back on the owner on a building that was not classified as a, of historic significance uh, uh, as to what they could and could not do. And, and so it, it really comes down to the question as to where, where are the boundaries as to when this is applied? And, and what are the, uh, you know, that's the basic question. Yeah. I'm not sure we can answer that um, because I, I've never heard of historic fabric being cited in a building that was not considered a historic resource. Uh, yeah, ultimately they challenged my licenses because I'm a licensed architect and structural engineer and I, they, did, they did that in front of my client and I, so I pulled out a piece of paper, wrote down my license numbers and handed it to the planner and the planner changed their tone at that point. And, we had to take the wall down, but we put it back to look like it was before. We made, out of plaster, we made concrete coping look like concrete coping, and we saved the old metal sash windows and all that type of stuff. But, um, and it's an attractive building to this day. But, but the thing is, is that, yes, um, the rest of that building we saved, but the, but the, the, but the two-story masonry walls had to go. And, uh, because we couldn't physically do it with, without causing more damage to the building. And so. I th I'd, I'd say that as with a lot of um, planning issues, there's a lot of subjectivity depending on who's reviewing it. Um, but I'm, you know, usually you can work something out. So I'm glad you were able to. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna push it back to Rochelle so she has time to do her portion of the presentation. All right. Interesting question, Dennis. Um, all right, let me share my screen. Um, everyone see the presentation? Yep. yep. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right, move my gallery display here. All right, so 
as Alan mentioned, um, the uh, Berkeley HRE shares a common um, shares common aspects with a lot of other uh, forms of documentation and recordation of historic uh, resources. Um, and I'll start before going into the case study of the Berkeley project we worked on. I'll kind of give like a generally a general overview of what they entail more in detail in any ways than what Alan uh, touched on. So um, when so I'm going to ask this question, but when is it uh, evaluation required? And <laughs> the shortest answer is it depends. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it depends on what the jurisdiction um, requires. Like, is it a part of a, is it on federal land? Um, what agency um, is it on? Is it owned by the state? Um, or is it subject to local um, uh, jurisdictions? Um, and their zoning codes. Um, the next question is, who can prepare one? Um, the short answer is a qualified professional. <laughs> Um, but you're probably wondering who is a qualified professional. Um, and that's usually defined again by what, whatever jurisdiction you're in, but most of them refer to the Secretary of the Interior uh, Professional Qualification Standards um, uh, for uh, the um, archaeology and historic preservation. And, and within those professional standards, usually the three they reference um, are as a qualified professional is if they have uh, qualifications in history, architectural history, or historic architecture. Um, a qualified historian um, is someone who, no, a qualified historian and a qualified architectural historian are similar in their requirements, but um, they only vary by the field. And, um, so qualified historian, you should, has to have a, a graduate degree in history, um, or closely related field, or they can have a bachelor degree and um, some related uh, professional um, uh, experience. And the standards usually define that a bit more um, specifically. I won't go into it since we're short on time. Um, like I said, qualified architectural historian, similar to a historian, um, but it's focusing on architectural history, um, specifically American architectural history. Um, again, and graduate degree or bachelor's degree plus experience. Um, now, a qualified historic architect is a little bit different in that not only do you need a professional degree, but you also need a license in architecture plus um, professional experience in um, uh, historic preservation. Um, so, uh, again, the details are laid out in the standards. Um, which you can look up under the Secretary of the Interior um, Standards for Professional Qualifications. Um, so when you found out you are a qualified professional or you have found a qualified professional, um, you're going to be asking what goes into the evaluation. Um, and like Al mentioned, it's basic, two basic things. Um, it's your description and documentation of the uh, property plus um, its determination of significance. Um, when you de describe and document the building, you're not only describing the building itself, but also its setting, such as the neighborhood, um, the street. Um, it's on, is it on a busy street? Is it on a quiet residential street? Um, the site itself, um, is it in a corner lot? Is it on a hill? Is the ground flat? Again, you're gonna document the building, um, its primary uh, massing features, details, construction, um, exterior, interior, uh, any associated buildings on the property, such as a garage, um, or even uh, landscape features if it's applicable. So the second part, after you're describing your building, you're also um, starting with, the, you start to determine your significance of the building, and you kind of start with the chrono chronological development, or the chrono chronological history. Um, in terms of alterations, additions, um, not just to the building, but also any changes in uses or users. Um, and resources to do that research, um, there's a lot out there, and it takes a while to gather them all and piece it together. Um, Sanborn maps, which are um, old um, 
uh, insurance maps from, uh, that covered, documented a lot of the buildings across the country from, um, I think it's like early, the 1800s all the way up until 1970s. Um, you can compare them over the years so you can see what's changed. Um, the, that's, you can see an example here on the right um, of a Sanborn map. Um, they're going to be looking at the building permit record, tax records, historical societies, noting though you may have to pay some fees, um, but they are very useful. Um, Berkeley Architectural um, Historical, or Baja, sorry, I've forgotten their, what their acronym stands for, but the Berkeley Architectural um, Society, uh, Historic Architecture Society, uh, was really helpful um, for my project uh, with Alan because um, they had more detailed um, building permit records than the city did. Um, anyways, uh, newspapers are also a great resource. Um, you can find, it's especially useful um, looking up the significance of um, potential users of the building, um, as well as sometimes you may find the building in the newspaper, but usually you won't find it if it's in a simple little bungalow. Not you know, <laughs> newsworthy at that time. Um, so anyways, uh, besides new papers, if you can find, if you have them, building plans and specs um, from the original all the way up to as late as you can get them as useful again to compare. And again, if you can have a photographic record of the building, also really helpful. Um, so you've gathered all your um, resources, you've looked at the chronology, now you're gonna kind of apply that and think about what it's significant for. Um, you're going to be thinking about it either is it individually significant or is it a contribute to a greater historic district? Um, and so you're also going to be thinking about when was that period of significance because um, that can um, be referred to in certain cases um, like if it was significant for a certain period or for a certain date, you may be able to um, remove some even if there was an addition. It, that addition may not be significant, depending on what you find out. So, oh, um, I want to show or point out this photo of this house on the right here in Berkeley. So you, it may not look too, looks like a simple bungalow. And like Alan kind of mentioned, you, and I think others have as well in the chat, and that it's not just a, architectural significance that um, we're worried about, but it's also cultural significance. Seemingly nondescript building here, but it's actually the um, house of William Byron Rumford, who was an African-American pharmacist and the first African-American from Northern California elected to California's legislator, and did a lot of civil rights work during the civil rights area, era. So um, who would know if he hadn't done the research? Uh, so, when you're thinking about why it's significant, there's different sets of criteria and there's different levels of, sorry, let me just start over, just rephrase this. Uh, you, you've, there's different sets of criteria to determine if a building is historically significant and it only for it to be considered significant. Um, there's different sets of criteria, and the first set you want to look at is the National Register um, criteria. And um, the first, it, there's, like I said, there's, it's a set, so there's four. Um, one is based around, is there a significant event that happened, um, or um, is, it, is the building associated with a broader pattern, broad pattern of history? Is it associated with a significant person? Um, is it associated with, because, is it significant because it represents a certain type um, or work of an architect? Um, and the fourth uh, criterion is um, primarily related to archeology. span Is it gonna yield um, inf information important to history or prehistory? Usually this doesn't apply, but um, it may. So I wanted to point that out. Um, California Register of Historic Resource Criteria is similar to the National Register. It just has language more focused on California, so um, I'll skim through this one. 
And then there's oftentimes local sets of criteria. And this again will vary depending on the municipality. So you have a background of what a lot of um, evaluations look like, how you can, who, may, who can make them. Um, I wanna go into a case study now, um, the project that we work with Andis on um, in this house in uh, South Berkeley. Um, and I'll be using it to exemplify the concepts or the, the HRE specific to Cal uh, Berkeley. So it was, as Alan touched on this, I'll skim through it. It was, the HRE was required because there was going to be a substantial change to this building um, and it was over 40 years old. So um, Alan has, is, exceeds requirements for historic architecture, um, professional qualifications, while since, uh, and then I um, exceed architectural history um, uh, qualifications. Uh, Berkeley references the Secretary of the Interior standard for their who um, is qualified to prepare an HRE. And they list uh, history, architectural history, and historic architecture. So that's why I kind of presented this a little bit backwards. Um, when the Berkeley HRE, um, again, what it will look like will vary depending on the municipality. But for Berkeley, they want you to use the state of California um, DPR 523 forms, which are essentially uh, standard survey forms that they use at, at the state. And then a lot of um, local jurisdictions reference those forms as well, like Berkeley here. Um, I thought the biggest, or the first form you're going to be looking at is the 523A, which is the primary record. And it's basically um, identifying, you're giving basic identifying information, like where it's located, address, and then you, that's where you, the building description comes in. Excuse me. So, this building, it's kind of <laughs> hard to get an overall shot of this house, but um, when we described it, we talked, that we talked about that it was thinking of the neighborhood. It's next to a park. Um, it's um, on a quiet ish residential street. It's on a corner at the site, it's on a corner lot. Um, it's very low slope to the site. The building itself, um, wood frame, shingled, um, single story, gabled roofs, um, interior. Um, it, it was plastered uh, walls, um, hardwood floors. Um, multi-light windows, double hung windows, um, and uh, there's a little bit more close-up view of that. There's also um, some buildings also on the site. Um, there is a small shed or a garage. I'm not sure what to call it. It opens off the street, so I called it a small garage. Um, would not fit a car, I would imagine today. Um, so. It's kind of how we describe it. it was, that's a very brief way of how we describe this building. Um, so the second part of our eight that um, DPR forms um, that uh, is the 523B forms, which um, is where you, the determination of significance comes in. In this form, you're not only um, uh, you're documenting what the style of the building is, um, its construction history, the current chronological history of the building. And the um, you're determining the significance of it. So for this building, uh, the style we said pretty obvious. <laughs> Craftsman bungalow, uh, exemplified by its low, wide um, massing and um, deep exposed eaves, um, cable roof. Excuse me, um, and the um, decorative uh, roof framing uh, features. In terms of its construction history, this um, bungalow was built in 1921 um, and it was designed by the architect A.W. Smith. Um, the home remained within the family um, of the original owner, um, this family, um, from 1921 until its sale in 2001. And we'd found, learned this from 
the building permit records. Um, based on the permit records and what we saw on site, there hadn't much changed about the building. Um, just minor things like some look like some window rehab work, re-roofing, um, uh, some finishes, finish updates to the bathrooms and the kitchen. Um, and then some uh, uh, solar tubes added to the roof. Um, the small garage uh, was built not long after the original building was built. It was built in 1925. I point this out specifically because I thought it was interesting in that um, in the 1929 and 1949 Sanborn maps, um, this small garage is located on the southwest corner of the lot, but here in this photo you see it's located on the northwest corner of the lot on the street. So we're not sure if and when it moved because we only have that Sanborn map and what we see here in person. Um, to, so if we aren't sure if Sanborn map, if there is an inaccuracy in it or um, if this did indeed move. So I guess it's an example of how you want to draw from a lot of sources um, to confirm um, what you can. So like I mentioned, there's different levels of, or different criteria to evaluate the significance of your building. There's, I'm gonna go through how this um, building applied, how it did and didn't apply to um, the um, National California and Berkeley criteria for significance. Um, so, but I'll start quickly by going through some of Berkeley's criteria um, in that they're very similar um, to, again, the national state requirements, um, just a little bit different wording. But I, the interesting um, component was the structure of merit, um, not a landmark, but a structure of merit, and that I think this A and D are of interesting applicability to this project. Um, basically, implant the criteria is that the age of a structure is contemporary. To be a structure of merit, it has to be contemporary with a designated landmark or neighborhood. Um, yeah, that's a good summary. <laughs> uh, Correct me if I'm wrong though, please, um, Stephen. Uh, this is my first kind of project in Berkeley. So um, I'm not claiming to be an expert in Berkeley here, but uh, so let's go through the criteria. So uh, I mentioned it's a Craftsman bungalow and so I'm gonna, okay, we have 15 minutes. Uh, it's Craftsman bungalow. Do we, while well, it features a lot of elements of the craftsman style, uh, we determined that the property was not significant enough individually as a um, embodiment of the craftsman bungalow, um, even at a local level, um, primarily because there are so many other craftsman bungalows in Berkeley that are still extant um, and they're all around the East Bay as well. Um, we thought it could be a potential contributor to a potential historic district. Uh, centered around um, uh, centered around bungalows or craftsman style, but again, you would have it that district would have to be documented and um, approved first. So, um, is it a work of a master? Um, like I mentioned, this build bungalow is designed by A. W. Smith. And A.W. Smith um, has come up a lot in, uh, supposedly a lot, a lot in a lot, excuse me, a lot of building permits around Berkeley and the East Bay. Um, he designed the, um, primarily single family, multifamily residences and small to medium sized commercial and industrial buildings in the East Bay over a 40 year career. Um, and uh, he's not known for following one particular style. Um, but rather kind of fluidly moving between them. Uh, but his, as an architect, he's, he's had a major impact on the um, character of the local region here. Um, some of his, two of his buildings are 
Berkeley landmarks, and there's also one of his buildings is a National Register, um, is on the National Register. Um, but although it was designed, this building was designed by A.W. Smith, we didn't think it was one of his significant works and warranted um, a, to be registered on the national, state, or even local um, registers based on the different criteria. Whoops. So criterion A and one, the patterns of history. So this home was located in the San Pablo Park neighborhood. And San Pablo Park is a subdivision um, originally um, part of the Matthews Tract that was developed. It was developed in 1906 by the Mason McDuffie Company um, in the East Bay. The Mason McDuffie Company is known um, for development of neighborhoods that focus around a landscape um, or have landscape features as a part of the development. In this case, it was San Pablo Park. Um, one thing to note is that this subdivision, the map for the subdivision was filed on November 21st, 1906. Um, this is significant because um, Oops, I lost my notes about it. Well, a lot of people were moving to the East Bay after the 1906 earthquake, and there's a lot of development um, in um, the Berkeley as a result. Um, and uh, this neighborhood, if it was documented, could potentially, not only could you have a historic district around craftsman styles, you could potentially have another historic district around this neighborhood and that it represents a, the patterns of, hist of Berkeley's development. Um, it also has some, excuse me, um, uh, uh, cultural um, history, uh, potentially some cultural significance to um, African American communities in Berkeley. But this was way outside our scope to <laughs> determine if this was a historic district or not. We're focusing on this bungalow. So it was essentially, we thought, um, since there was very little information and documentation about a, the significance of the San Pablo Park neighborhood, um, um, uh, sorry, I lost my place here. Yeah, so while the Brower House lacks the individual distinction for national state level and local registries, registries, we thought it could be a potential contributor to an undocumented and undesignated historic district um, encompassing the San Pablo Park neighborhood as defined by the original um, development map. But again, uh, or excuse me, the district would be significant under criterion A if it was further researched and confirmed um, for its potential contribution, contributions to the patterns of history's, Berkeley's developmental history. Um, but again, more research and documentation would need to be done on this. So um, we, uh, in terms of the local criteria, again, it, we didn't think it meant Berkeley's landmark requirements. It could have potentially met the structure of merit requirements, but you would have to have that um, historic district um, nominated first, or listed, excuse me, listed first. So it was to, it was a potential of a potential, which, um, which is why we said, we said it wasn't significant um, even right now for um, a district or a contributor. So, what if we did find, if we did find it to be significant though, um, it, we would have had Andis and, <laughs> Andis and potentially we would have had to prepare an analysis of Andis design to see if it complied with the secretary and tier standards for rehabil rehabilitation, which we kind of touched on in our questions earlier. Um, and if, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, you can find more details online again um, with on the Secretary of the Interior um, standards, 
for rehab, but the general idea is that it assumes that at least some repair or alteration of the historic building will be needed um, in order to provide an efficient contemporary use of a, of a historic building, but it allows some um, leeway it, for new additions or new work um, to, meet, to meet contemporary needs. Um, however, it does the standards do require that historic fabric and character is maintained as much as possible and that new work is differenti differentiated but compatible with the existing. So anyways, it's so a whirlwind. Um, and yeah, it was a really interesting project. Um, oh, I believe I skipped one. My nerves got to me. So I'll go back to it real quick. I mentioned patterns of history criteria, um, architectural criteria, but I didn't talk about the significant persons. So this home was built for an insurance broker. Um, and again, it stayed within their family for until 2001. And interestingly, uh, well, after doing some newspaper research, census records, we didn't find that the family um, were significant to local, state, or national history. So that's why we didn't think, in summary, we didn't think this building met the criteria for significance um, for um, the national, state, or local um, criteria. All right, and that's where I will conclude. And I will stop. Unless, is there any questions? I didn't say my chat screen is off to the side somewhere. I'm looking at the chat screen here, uh, Rochelle, and all you have is compliments. No. Oh. <laughs> well, thanks, everyone. Does anyone have any questions? I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I do want to give you guys opportunities to ask questions. There's actually quite a lot of comments on the chat. I can't go into them now. I'll stop sharing. I think that'll help me. Oh, there it is. Okay. Is there, I, I won't be wasting your time reading this. Is there is a question in the chat that you want to ask out in person? <laughs> well, I'd like to jump in here and, and piggyback, oh, yeah, off, yes. piggyback off of the question about George Washington, George Washington sleeping there. Uh, you know, it's, um, that may have been significant, but, but so minorly significant. Uh, it's very much a subjective determination, you know? Um, why that would be significant for a, for a building, but uh, it's true there are events in a neighborhood that, can, that contribute to the significance of a, of a building. Um, and, uh, you know, they have to be taken into context. So how, just uh, kind of with, with his, uh, whose question was that? Whoever asked that question, diagram, uh, you know, what, determines whether something's historical. Is, is it really, how subjective is it that uh, this is determined? And, and is the HRE an attempt to objectify it a little more? I think that's a very good question. Um, and I think uh, uh, everything, that the, everything the question poses is true. It is somewhat subjective. Um, it is applied generally locally, you know, by a local jurisdiction. You may have a local jurisdiction that, that is not concerned about the interior of a building. They don't think it contributes to the, to the, you know, the character of the city. Other cities care very much about interiors. Um, so yeah, it, it is applied uh, uh, very subjectively. And the HRE uh, is a form to, you know, to, to, as you can see from what R Rochelle was saying, 
it's, it's, it's not speculation. You have a great deal of research um, that goes into it. You have a basis for any decisions you're making. Um, you, you know, you're establishing not just this is my opinion, but this is why we think what we think. And the local jurisdiction then has a chance to either agree or not agree uh, with our interpretation. So it's, it's incumbent on us to make sure that whatever opinions we put into a report are supported. That being said, there is definitely a, a, a subjective element. Seems to me that that's a risky thing when we're talking about the built environment, is it being that subjective. Uh, the reason is, is that if, if uh, any, any Frank Lloyd Wright building anywhere, no matter how good or bad it is, any Julia Morgan building, how good or bad it is, is of historic significance simply because they did it. Um, and it's an education as to what that architecture was of that period. Um, I, it's, I'm an advocate of, of, of historic preservation as long as, 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 it, as it is preserving history and that we gotta be really, really careful when we start tearing things that can't be replaced tearing down things that can't be replaced. And um, I'm, I'm surprised that an architect from that period who, who is in the National Register would not, be, that some of his work would not be considered, but just a couple things would. Um, with any architect, it's the balance of their work and the growth of that person over the years. Uh, if, we tore, if we tore down certain, certain buildings of, of Frank Lloyd Wright, we would, like the like we have with the fire of the uh, uh, of the uh, International Hotel in Tokyo of Frank Lloyd Wright's, we lost a huge portion of of history as to what influenced the man. Yeah. Well, Dennis, I would I would say that that frankly, if if our job in doing an HRE was restricted to gathering information and not forming a conclusion, we'd be perfectly happy if that were the case. Um, but by documenting everything that we find, like the fact that it was A.O. Smith uh, design, uh, the fact that there was a potential, you know, uh, historic neighborhood there, by documenting all that and then making our, uh, or, you know, presenting our opinion, at least we're presenting the evidence that would allow somebody else to challenge it. And like I said, if we, if we could just present the information and let the city decide, we'd be perfectly happy to do that, but they're not... You know, they do not want to have that responsibility, I, I can only assume. Um, Alan or, and or Michelle, could you uh, talk a little bit about what happened uh, with the planner when, you, when we first um, submitted that and they were starting to go down what looked like it might be a black hole, um, asking for more information and, and more uh, research? I love Michelle answer that. Yes, they had initially asked for more research. Well, more narrative on our research in that we only initially only wrote um, arguments as to why something, why we thought it would be potentially significant. We didn't talk about the things we didn't think, it, like clearly to us, it wasn't significant for like if there's a significant person there we didn't talk about it because that's what we had found um we're used to writing just we're used to documenting what it's significant for not um yeah not including what it's not significant for um, but in any case the additional research we had to add was just a narrative explaining why we didn't think it um, was significant for um if the, for the different criteria um i have a question yes um, is it possible, do you think that, or what do you think about the possibility that something that is considered significant now is in the future not considered significant? And for context, I would just mention that in various parts of the country, monuments which were at one time considered historically significant are now being considered not historically significant and removed. 
No, I think you just answered your own question. Um, probably better than I could. I guess. I guess I was having trouble <laughs> understanding the question, but it might be. I have another question. Yes. Um, you know, it, some of us, not Josh, but some of the rest of us are old enough to maybe remember back to when we were all drawing with pencil. And so we've seen quite a lot of changes go on in the world, just like our parents did, who maybe saw things emerge that they never imagined, like television or radio. And so um, what I'm wondering is, and I kind of tried to get at this in an earlier question, is whether um, there might be ways uh, to, um, there might be other avenues of historic preservation that didn't exist 30 years ago, but are actual opportunities to do something that is akin to what historic preservation does in the future. Like for example, Alan's left so I can mention him. I mean, there are techniques now where you can almost preserve a person. They're three-dimensional characterization. You can make them move, you can make them talk, sound like they talk and all that kind of stuff. I'm just wondering if there is, oh, there he's back. Uh, I wonder if it's a real one. It's a simulation. There's also <laughs> possibility that, you know, you might be able to, um, at some point in the future, you know, there may be another way of preserving his, the history of buildings, a rich way. I mean, all these buildings that are designated landmarks, most people don't know anything about them. They have no way to experience them. They can't go inside them. Um, not much context. And I'm just wondering if any of you think that there is, given the way times change and the things we do change, if there is a possibility that as time goes by, that the field of historic preservation will open into new avenues that are not being followed now. Thank you. I, I think that's an excellent, uh, excellent question to think about. Um, I do want to mention it's after 1.30. And so if you want to leave the chat, um, do so. But if people want to hang out a bit, uh, that's fine too. Can I make a comment about this, about technology? Go ahead. Um, because I'm involved with a project um, on Treasure Island. And as many of you know, the island was originally built for the World's Fair in 1938. And just from personal experience, one of the things that I'm trying to do as a way of preserving uh, history, preserving architecture, is to create sort of a, um, a virtual view, three-dimensional view um, of the island when it was the World's Fair. Because nobody, people don't know, talk about people walking by homes and not knowing what happened there. So many people don't even know that the fair was there. And that's a huge, that was a huge uh, project. So if people could pick up their phone, for example, and look over to Treasure Island and see the original World's Fair, I'm just saying that's one way where it's actually um, could be working today to help people understand the history and preservation. I believe some either parks or uh, museums are using some of that technology. I think it just depends where. Um, I think people are looking into it. For sure, so exploring it, uh, especially trying to engage the younger audiences too. With the they're so more much more adept at using the digital tools we have now. There was an architect uh, back the, back in the 1910s, back in Pennsylvania, who built a museum, uh, Henry Mercer, that was uh, all of the discarded tools that were laying around wagon wheels, cobblers tools, things on that line, and he set them up for people to come in and, ha and touch and feel as to what their, what their fathers or ancestors used to, man to build this America with. And it was that tactile feel of those materials that, that made that museum so extremely uh, vibrant. And my, 
it, it goes back to it, everything we were talking about here. It's a situation of where, how do you replace that? How do you, how do you uh, let a person understand fully what it was like back then, how, why they are the way they are today if they can't touch and feel it? Can I, can I say something? It, it, if they're touching and feeling a historic uh, artifact, why, why does that, what's the significance of that except for the, the personal interaction between the person touching the artifact and his own or her own, you know, emotions and feelings? Why can't the same emotions and feelings be gotten from a rip, reproduction of those artifacts, especially ones that are made the same way those artifacts are made? Because they're not, they're not made the same way. Why not? I, this, is, this is what I was thinking about. It, it, we traveled in Japan recently and, and were struck by the, their different approach to historic preservation. They, they would preserve a building by reconstructing it, demolishing it and reconstructing it every 40 years. Which is a religious thing in, in Japan. Um, right, but what they're doing is not only preserving the, the architectural and functional appearance and the materials of that of that uh, 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 facility, they're also preserving the knowledge of how to do it. And they use old materials and old tools. And the, the, the historic building is only 40 years old at most, but it lasts forever in that, as long as the uh, civilization lasts. Uh, I, I, I posted in, in, the, in the chat a quotation from a book that, that's one of my dad's masonry manuals, dated back 1924 which spoke, speaks directly to what you're saying, in which this was what they were teaching masonry contractors back then. It says, when we build, let us think that we build forever. Let it, be for, let it not be for present delight nor for present use alone. Let it be such work as our descendants will thank us for. And let us think as we lay stone on stone that a time is to come when those stones will be held sacred because our hands have touched them. And that men will say, as they look upon the labor and wrought substance of them, see, this our father did for us. It's, yeah, I, I read that, Dennis, and, and uh, I have a significant problem with that, because let us consider that we build things forever. They don't last forever. They, nope. always, they always need to be maintained and improved and modified. Um, and and that's, that's one of the aspects of the built environment that's valuable, is that it can be maintained and improved and, and modified. Um, but so, that's not historic preservation. That's a, I know. I have a I have a problem with historic preservation. The way we're we're uh, idolizing the the very rock that our father touched just because he touched it. Yeah. To the detriment of the people who are living in that house, who might be struck by that rock in a big earthquake. Well, the Plymouth Rock people go to see the Plymouth Rock because it was there. And well, I know that's not part of the built environment, though. Yeah. Can I jump in? Can you guys hear me? I want to jump in with Josh on this because I've worked on some older buildings and I, I, uh, I completely value like good examples of historical urban fabric and buildings. But I worry, of, you know, that we fetishize our work. And, and this is maybe a good time to like, it's probably like a, a really good historic time to say, you know, at what, how much are we talking about the work of a bunch of white men who decided that everything they did was really important and had to be worshipped and licked by every generation that came afterwards. And th there really is well, room. I, I would be critical of them just because of the race of the people. Like, um, I don't know. Have a little more humility about it. Like, all this stuff doesn't really have to last forever. I'm not saying build in a shoddy way. I'm saying that every building by a famous architect isn't necessarily something worth keeping. Um, if I were super famous, I don't know that I'd want all of my things preserved as an example of that. And I also think we just have to make room, you know? And uh, some of this, it, it, it starts to border on the absurd sometimes. Well, I, I hate to I hate to be you know a, 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 a peacemaker because it's not my nature, but um, what I think what Josh is pointing out because I'm aware of the, of the same situation you were talking about in, in our Japanese temples, I was thought you know to me it was just 
so different from the way I thought about it, but still, obviously, well thought out for reasons, and certainly traditional way of, of preserving even more than just the, maybe you're not preserving the physical property, but you're preserving the actual techniques and to some extent, you know, the, the, the approach of the property. Oh, yes. but you're the essence of it and the meaning of it. And I, and I will add that, you know, to, to Kurt's uh, uh, comments that if you read, if you read, uh, you know, histories of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, and, and the fires at Taliesin, um, you begin to get this feeling that he didn't care. I mean, yeah. Right, and Julian Morgan burned on he, he, he didn't go into mourning for the for the portion of the building that was lost. It just gave him uh, an opportunity to do it again in a different way. I mean, he also didn't care about his clients. Well, of course, yeah, yeah. or or his women, or his wives. Yeah, exactly. or waterproofing. <laughs> he should stick to his stained glass. I'm going to have to jump off this. It's a, a fascinating. But, and, and, uh, yeah, I think, you know, we, we don't get to see each other very often, so it's I just know. wonderful to, to have a little chat with everybody. And we, uh, we, could, we could go far afield here, um, yeah. but I have to go pretty soon. I don't know about other people, but being the host, I guess I'm going to have to close out the meeting. So is there anything else to, uh, to bring up? Rachel, you're gone. You're... Thank you, yeah, I just wanted to say thanks to Alan. It was a great presentation. Oh, glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Yes. I, Alan I and Rachel. Say that, wonderful. That it was great. Everybody's learning this. I think you did a fantastic job. It was a great presentation, and uh, we're all we're all learning this together. And I think it went really well. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for you. doing it. Thanks Thank everybody. You. Nice to see you all. Thanks to everybody. Thank you. Great job, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.